I want to thank all of you for being here with us on this Easter weekend. I, I hope that you have a tremendous weekend with friends and family as we remember that death has been defeated. Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, not everyone feels that way. I have met many people that attend churches that do not celebrate Easter, or for that matter, any religious holiday. I remember one Christmas season when one of those folks strolled in on a Sunday morning, came right up to me and said, I need to know what you believe about Christmas trees. When I responded that I loved them, the more the merrier, I found out that was not the answer he was looking for. And I wonder about churches like that. I mean, when they have a VBS for kids, do they sing, if you're happy and you know it, you're doing it wrong? (laughs) One of the things that I love about the holidays, like Easter, like Christmas, one of the ways that you can tell that the holiday is upon us is by how people dress. The clothes told you something about the holiday at Christmas time. People get out their ugly sweaters. I remember as a child, the sure sign that it was Easter was the dresses and the hats for the ladies and the guys would bust out their suits and their white shoes. So I was born in 1970 and the 70s were the absolute worst fashion decade in the history of humanity. And if you wonder why the 70s were the worst fashion decade in history, it's simple because all of the fashion designers in the 70s grew up in the 60s smoking dope and that's all they did. And the result of that, two words, leisure suits. It's from a 1970s JCPenney catalog right there. That's looking good. They, they had to stop wearing leisure suits, though, because they found out they caused cancer. <laughs> so as a kid, I would go to church, and I would see the new hats, I would see the white shoes, and I would know it's a special day. And the interesting thing is the tradition of wearing new clothes on Easter is traced all the way back to Jesus. Because at the end of the Gospel of John, when the women... On Easter Sunday, go to the tomb and the stone is rolled away and the body is missing. They come and they tell the disciples, text says that Peter and John ran there and they look inside. And you've always heard that the tomb was empty and that's not totally accurate. There was still something in the tomb. Old grave clothes. The clothes they put on the dead body of Jesus were still in that tomb. So I guess maybe the angels brought him some new clothes to wear. And the disciples had to have had their their memories jogged to that time when the disciples had been to another formerly unoccupied tomb that was now unoccupied. And that was the tomb of their good friend Lazarus. Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha, and Jesus loved that entire family. The Bible records several instances where Jesus visited that home. But now Jesus is off in a different part of the country, and he gets word from the sisters of Lazarus that Lazarus is very sick, and not just a little sick, but the kind of, I don't think he's going to make it kind of sickness. So Jesus Rather than immediately going back to Bethany where Lazarus was sick, he stayed a couple more days. In fact, by the time that he did arrive, Lazarus had died and they already had the funeral and he was in a tomb and it was shut. And as far as Mary and Martha were concerned, this powerful Messiah that could heal the sick was late. So he shows up. I want you to read with me in John chapter 11, beginning in the 20th verse. The Bible says, When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. 
Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And that is a great question. Because Jesus is not asking Martha if she believes in a doctrine called resurrection. He did not say, I give a resurrection or I promise a resurrection. I guarantee a resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection. Do you believe this? Because ultimately, Easter is not a day. Easter is not a concept. Write this down. Easter is a person to trust. Do you believe Jesus? I've tried to pattern my ministry after Jesus because I really do believe that he is indeed the son of God. But there has been one area of my ministry where Jesus is no help. And that is how to conduct a funeral. Because every time Jesus went to a funeral, he would just say, get up. And the funeral was over. So he is not challenged by the task of raising Lazarus. The challenge Jesus has, and the challenge he always has had, is raising faith in his identity. Because it is always easier to acknowledge a doctrine than it is to surrender to a person. And so all over the world, Orthodox Christians are meeting and agreeing in their heads in the idea of a resurrection. And then they leave and they go and they live like Easter never happened. The, their lives are not centered on the reality that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. It's not just what he does. It is who he is. And Jesus is still asking that question. Do you believe me? Because it will change everything, especially what you wear. Now, I'm going to explain that in just a moment. So they take Jesus to the tomb where Lazarus was laid, and, and he starts to cry. It says in verse 38, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time, there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Now, I believe that Jesus is Lord. And in this text, Jesus gave three commands. And if Jesus says to do something, there is a reason to obey him. And the very first thing that Jesus said was to take away the stone because Jesus is giving us hope. And as soon as he said those words, take away the stone, the voice of doubt arose. Jesus is reminded by Martha that Lazarus has been in this tomb for four days. And the reason that mattered in those days when technology and science were more primitive, you were not always sure if a guy was dead or not. Maybe he was in a deep coma and a day later he would come back. But by four days, if he is dead, the body starts to stink. By four days, 
if he is dead, dead, not mostly dead, but dead, dead, then there's going to be an odor. In the King James Bible, it says, but Lord, he stinketh. So Martha is saying, God, you're too late. And to be honest, we've all told God that he was too late at times. What day did you give up? Because we live in a four-day world, don't we? There was that day when you said, I'm never going to get well. I'll never get fit. I'll never get out of debt. I'm never going to get another job. I'll never get over what they did to me. My marriage is never going to get better. My son is never going to come home. My daughter is never going to straighten up. Was it the fourth day? Was it the 44th day? We live in a fourth day world. And there is great pressure to conform to what always has been, to settle for the status quo, and to just keep the stone over the opening and to let decay win the day. And so on this Easter day, we must decide if we believe that Jesus is the resurrection, that we will not let the hum of a fallen world drown out the call of the risen Jesus Christ. Jesus is asking them, and Jesus is asking us to take a step in the direction of our profession. You said you believe that Jesus is the resurrection. If that's true, then take away that stone. Jesus is asking us to take a step in the direction of hope. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Easter people are hopeful people. And hope is not positive thinking that if I just try harder, and I'll, I'll be able to get it right next time. Hope is a passionate trust in what God can do because God is no respecter of stones. So don't put a period where God has placed a comma. God is no respecter of stones. He is the redeemer of the people that are trapped behind them. And so Jesus called out, Lazarus, come out. And the reason he had to call him by name is because if Jesus had simply said, come out, all of the dead would have come out. And you know what? One day he will shout and all of the dead will come out. But on this day, Jesus just wanted Lazarus back because Jesus is calling us out. I, I used to wonder, why did Jesus cry right before he raised Lazarus? He knew what it was that he was about to do, so he wasn't crying because he was sad for Lazarus. I believe that he was disturbed I believe he was deeply upset as he came face to face with what sin has done to the divine intent. You see, Jesus was there when the world was created. He saw how good it was. It was not a world meant for cemeteries or cancer wards or rehab centers or divorce courts or abortion clinics. That's not the world that God created, but it is the world that sin has messed up. And so he knows that there is something deeper going on there. Before Jesus could defeat death, he had to destroy sin. And that is why the biggest test that Jesus ever faced was not an occupied tomb. It was an unoccupied cross. Romans chapter 4, verse 25. 
He was handed over to die because of our sins. And he was raised to life to make us right with God. You see, what sin did was introduce death to the whole world. God said in the very beginning, if you turn your back on me, if you disobey and rebel against me, you are going to die because God is the source of life. And when you get disconnected from God, you get disconnected from real life. And what happens is that we all wind up dead. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and in sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. The reason that the world doesn't think it's dead is because deadness is normal. When you are surrounded by deadness, it feels normal. But the reality is that the world is cut off from the life of God. And what can a dead man do to save himself? And there's only one right answer. Nothing. Lazarus was not making some cognitive decision in that tomb. He wasn't thinking, you know, if I just hear my name, I think I'll get up and walk out. He was dead. And when you are dead... You are without hope. It doesn't matter whether you are rich dead or poor dead or Republican dead or Democrat dead. If you are dead, you are dead. And you cannot do a thing to save yourself. So understand when he said those words, Lazarus, come out. In the very word of command was the power to enable him to respond to the command. The God who is calling you from deadness to life is in fact giving you the very life you need to respond to the call. That's why our Bibles tell us, continuing in Ephesians 2, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. So if you are saved today, if you have received new life in Christ today, you don't judge. You don't look down on anybody. You are not condescending because you know that you are only alive because of the gift of God. He saves dead people. And there is no reason for you to live one more day dead in your sins. Because it's not up to you to do something. It's up to God. It's up to you to respond to the call of Jesus. But the call, and by the way, he is calling some of you today by name. But this call is not just to leave the tomb. The call is to leave your clothes. Because when he said... Lazarus, come out. He did, just like this. So Jesus said one more thing, and I think it might have been one of the most important commands of all. Take off those grave clothes and let him go. Because Easter means that Jesus is setting us loose. And I want you to really lean in for the next few minutes because I'm about to explain why it is that you can see a Christian that say they believe what they believe and behave the way that they do. But first, let me tell you the story of Christopher Miller. He was arrested in 2014 in Tom's River, New Jersey for robbing a stride right shoe store. Here's why that's interesting. In 1999, 15 years earlier, he was arrested for robbing the exact same store. He spent prison, time in prison, 15 years for that crime. He gets out of prison. He was released in Atlantic City. 
He buys a bus ticket travels to Tom's River, New Jersey, gets off the bus, goes to the exact same store he robbed 15 years earlier and tries to rob it again. Now, the people in the store would not cooperate. He gets agitated, so he grabs some money. He takes some of the employees' cell phones and he runs down the street. He literally throws the money on the sidewalk, throws the cell phones in a garbage can, and he's arrested just a couple blocks around the corner. And the sheriff said, Christopher has no idea what to do with freedom. He only knows life behind bars. So he wants to stay there. And there are a lot of Christians. And they are saved. They have been raised to new life in Jesus Christ, but they are still bound in the garbs of death. They are still enslaved by the choices and the habits of their old life because there is a fashion designer out there who wants to tell you exactly how you should dress. You may have heard the story of the man who was watching sports on TV all afternoon and his wife finally said, well, if you're going to just sit there and do that, I'm going to go to the mall and walk around for a couple of hours. And he said, fine, but just don't buy anything. Well, she comes back a couple hours later and she has a brand new dress. And he stands up. He says, I thought we agreed that you weren't going to buy anything. And she said, well, I didn't intend to. I just wanted to try it on to see how it looked. But when I put it on in the dressing room, the devil showed up and he said, my, do you look fine in that dress? And her husband said, well, you should have said, get thee behind me, Satan. And she said, I did. And he said, "Ooh, it looks good from behind, too. And many people, just like you, are going to heaven, but you are walking through hell because you will not put on your Easter clothes. You are still wearing the old clothes that smell of death before you got saved. Because... You don't understand now that you have been set free. You don't have to carry that stuff around with you anymore. Do you really believe that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is powerful enough to forgive you of all of your sins and all of your past junk, but not powerful enough to free you from all of your sins and your past junk? Easter means forgiveness, but it also means freedom. It means that he is calling you out of the deadness, but it also means he's setting you free so that you don't have to go through life like you have been anymore. He came to redeem us, but also to release us to be who God intended us to be. In other words, you don't get free and come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and you find freedom. That should be on Facebook. So for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about what it means to live in the kind of Easter freedom that we were meant for, the kind of freedom that Jesus purchased for us, that he rose from the grave to give to us. You don't have to live in bondage to a bad temper. You don't have to live in prison to your lust. You don't have to live enslaved to greed. You don't have to stay in the darkness of a bad attitude. You don't have to live in the prison of what you did or in the prison of what somebody else did to you. You don't have to live the rest of your life fearful and worried, being a people pleaser, constantly concerned about what somebody else thinks about you. You can live free. And do you know how you can? Well, I'm going to tell you that next week. (laughs) But I'm going to give you a hint right now. Because some of you are living in a prison that the resurrection of Jesus has already unlocked. 
And the wrong question is, do I have enough grit? Do I have enough willpower to overcome this? The right question is, did the resurrection of Jesus Christ break every chain and overcome every bondage that I am in? And am I in Him? Because if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Write this down. Freedom is the capacity to live your life as the new person God created you to be. Because Jesus has got up, none of us ever has to be held down anymore by anything that stinks and belongs in the grave. Don't put a comma where God has put a period. You see, God has said, that old life is over, period. But you have to trust a person and not just agree with a doctrine. I read a story about some of the World War II prisoners that survived the infamous Bataan Death March in the Philippines. When they were liberated, because of the horrendous nature of their captivity, the disease, the deceit, they could not believe their good news. They thought it might be a hoax. One man in particular, Captain Burt Bank, was from Alabama, and he had almost lost his eyesight because of vitamin deficiency that he was suffering while being imprisoned. So he wouldn't move. He could not grasp the idea that his imprisonment was now over. So they found a soldier from the deep south with that southern drawl. And with that southern accent, he came to him silently and said, Captain, why don't you move? Don't you want to be free, Captain? And a smile started to come across his face because he heard a voice he could trust. And that voice, my friend, the one that you can trust, is calling you by name because you were not made for grave clothes. Easter is a person to trust and freedom is a promise to wear. And so what we're going to be doing for the next several weeks is talking about how we dress in what we possess. How do we step into the kind of life that we were meant for? I don't care who you are. I don't care what it is that you have done. You were meant for the life that Jesus is offering because the Bible says that he gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. Free is for all. But you can't break free on somebody else's relationship to Jesus. You're going to have to start responding yourself to his call. Which means... You're going to have to stop listening to the voice of a fourth day world. One of my favorite stories is from the childhood of Booker T. Washington, who grew up on a plantation as a slave. And he said the most hated sound of his childhood was a rooster that would crow every morning long before the sun ever came up. For him, it was the sound of slavery. It was a reminder of another back-breaking day picking cotton and living in bondage with no hope for a better future. Then one day a new voice came to the plantation. It declared that a man named Abraham Lincoln had signed something called the Emancipation Proclamation and slavery was now over and everyone was now free. He went to bed. And the next morning, he heard that rooster again. This time, it sounded a little different. So he got up and looked out the window, and his mother was chasing that bird around the yard with an axe. <laughs> and that day, they had fried alarm clock for lunch. <laughs> you see, they destroyed the voice of slavery. And you can too. You were not meant to to shuffle through life, all wrapped up in stinky old clothes. Easter is not a day. Easter is not a doctrine. 
It is a lifestyle because he is a person and he is calling your name. Do you believe this? Stand up. I want to pray over you. Father, I am praying right now, believing with all my heart that your Holy Spirit is calling by name some people that are listening to me. They didn't get up expecting when they came to church today that anything would be different, but Lord, from the very first Easter Sunday, you have been doing things people do not expect. And so we are claiming that right now. We do not have to listen to fourth day logic anymore. We can be free in Christ Jesus and have the lives we were intended to have by our good Father. So give us the courage to step in the direction, to step in the direction of Easter. Give us the courage to believe the voice of Jesus. And we pray this in his name. And I want to say that if you have a decision to make today, maybe, maybe you want to rededicate your life to Jesus. You've, you've been having some wardrobe malfunctions. And you realize you keep putting on those old grave clothes. Then I want you to come forward. I'm going to be down front and I can pray with you. Maybe you want to be baptized into Jesus today and give him your whole heart. You know what? We'll go up and get into that cold water and I'll baptize you today. I just want you to come forward. Let's finally live like there ain't no grave that can keep us down.